For the final two parts of this unit, I want to just take you through some examples of, of using matplotlib to create different types of plots. And we're going to start, first of all, with two-dimensional data. So that is XY data, um, because, of course, that's the, the most common thing you come across. So, so far, we've used plot.plot, dot plot, and it's good for creating line plots. And you can also use it to create um, scatter plots. Um, and in physics, scatter plots and line plots are probably the most common types of plots you go and do. But you also need to prepare other types of plots, depending on the circumstances. So, for example, you might need to go and do a histogram. A histogram, of course, is an appropriate plot to use when you want to show how frequently um, some sort of data appears, some sort of values appear in your data. Um, and so here I've um, uh, created a set of uh, random numbers uh, based on a normal distribution. Um, uh, in fact, I've created a lot of random numbers there. Um, and then I've used the plot.hist function in order to make a histogram uh, of the data. And plot.hist um, will take in the values I want to make a histogram of. I can optionally specify um, uh, the how the bins should be. So in this case, I've actually told it how I want the, the bins uh, to be. Um, and it also takes in other parameters which control how the, the histogram will look. Um, and the main one here, as I've said, that um, essentially I want the bins to be 0 0.2 uh, points wide in terms of the value, but I want the actual bar it draws to be a little bit less. You get a thin little line, white line between each bar, so you can see how the bars are separated. Plot.hist actually returns you back three bits of information when you call it. So you get the number of values that are in each bin and each bar. Um, you also get the x coordinates of the edges of each bin of each bar. Well, sorry, each of each bin. So each each group is used. So um, if you have ten bars, then you'll get ten numbers back in the first parameter, and you'll get eleven numbers back in the second parameter because it's giving you the left and right edges. Uh, and obviously, the left edge of the uh, of the second bin is the same thing as the right edge of the first bin. So uh, if you have n bins, you need n plus one edges. And then the third thing it gives you back um, is a list of the actual things used to draw the bars in matplotlib. Generally speaking, that last parameter we don't need to worry about too much. So um, typically we end up assigning it to the underscore variable. So again, in Python syntax, underscore is a legitimate name for a variable. And conventionally, we use it to say, we recognize that this function is giving us back a value here, but we're not interested in it. So we're, we just give it the, to the underscore variable. Um, and as I said, you can, you can do quite a lot of control over the histogram by um, adjusting how the bins parameter is set. So you can, for example, set it so that the bins are not uniformly spaced. Um, or you can specify the number of bins, or you can just leave it up to his to you know, decide what to go and do for you. Another really important plot in physics is to plot things with error bars. The general rule is that if you have an uncertainty in the value and that uncertainty is bigger than the size of the actual marker you're trying to use to go and plot your data with, then you should show an error bar. Um, and in order to go and do that in matplotlib, we use the plot.errorbar function. And it works quite like plot.plot .plot in this it'll take a set of x and y data points. Um, and um, it will draw either lines or lines and markers. But if you give it the uh, parameters x -er and or y -er, it will also draw the corresponding error bar. Um, and those x -er and y -er, um, are uh, typically um, an array of numbers that's the same length as your x and y data points. Um, here I'm just using another column, another couple of columns from my data set to represent the error bar. So I've gone and just calculated a sort of error bar based on the, the data set as well to give you a sort of made up example. Um, and again, as we did previously, I'm only plotting every fourth data point. So you actually can see um, the, the error bars that I've got here. Um, and so you can see in that call to error bar, I'm also specifying that I wanted a, a marker that was a small square. Um, the cap size parameter is being used to specify the 
the uh, end uh, bar of the error bars, so the thing that sort of uh, runs perpendicular to the error bar at, the, at either end of it. Um, uh, and also, I've told it I don't want a line style, so I've just passed it as an empty string there, and I'm giving it a label. And the rest is standard matplotlib. Sometimes you're going to do scatter plots. Although plot dot plot can do scatter plots, um, PyPlot actually has a, a built-in um, scatter function that allows you to do a whole bunch more tricks. And so one of the things, for example, you might want to go and do is you might want to add extra information by using colors or the size of the marker point to uh, convey that extra information. Um, and this can be done using plot.scatter and um, some of the keyword parameters. So in this example, what I've done here is um, I've done the same scatter plot, but now I've passed it um, a size, that's the S parameter in uh, plot.scatter. And the size data I'm using is just simply, again, another column of my uh, data set um, suitably uh, multiply to make it uh, give a reasonable um, variation in size. And then I'm also via the color parameter passing it um, a uh, list of colors to use. Um, and there I've just used np.where to select either red or blue. So all the data where the y value is outside the range of plus or minus a half get colored red and everything that was within plus or minus half um, gets colored blue, and in addition, I have the, the size variable. Um, I should say here, the uh, as well as the color uh, keyword parameter, it also has an alias, which is C, um, just like we're using S for size, you can use C for color. Um, and then that gets relevant in our next example. So uh, what we did in the previous example, I just had a, 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 a given us a, a specific color for each data point. Um, that conveyed some information about the um, the data. If you want to um, have a, a continuously varying variable controlling the size, controlling the color you use, um, then what you're looking at is using is a color map. So a color map is used when you want to change a value, so just a number, into a color within a range of a spectrum of colors. Um, a matplotlib actually comes with a whole range of color maps built into it. Um, and we'll just use a couple of examples here. Um, and what we're able to go and do is tell matplotlib that um, this array of numbers is supposed to control the color. And then this color map will tell it how to translate a number into a specific color. So here's an example where we're doing this. So um, the matplotlib.cm module contains uh, uh, all the color maps. Uh, and I'm just going to import a couple in here, um, the default one. It's called Viridis, um, and then I'm also going to import gray, um, which, as the name suggests, maps colors to a gray scale. Um, so here what I've done in the scatter plot is, I've just, again, I've passed the same size data. I'm now passing the colors, um, which is now just a, another array of my data um, via the C parameter. Um, for this particular purpose, you can't use the colors uh, parameter, you have to use C. Um, and I pass it a C map. And so what it does is it looks at the range of numbers that I've passed via the C parameter, and it maps the biggest one of those to the top end of the color map, and the smallest one to the bottom end of the color map, and everything else in between. And so you see in this data set here, in effect, I'm coding uh, four different, well, three different variables. So I have a set of uh, uh, one independent variable X, and I'm encoding, obviously, the Y coordinate, so the position. I'm encoding another one, which is the size. And I'm encoding yet another variable as the color. And so I'm containing many bits of information about those data points, all just in the one plot. Again, quite often we end up needing to go and deal with um, uh, log scale plots, um, either plotting on log log or log linear. Um, and there's a couple of ways you can go about doing this. You can plot uh, dot semilog x or semilog y or log log functions, um, and those will go and plot your data on the corresponding uh, plots. Um, I actually think in some ways the, the nicer way to do this is to use the 
um, plot dot uh, x scale and plot dot y scale. Sorry, there's a typo there. It should be plot dot x scale and plot dot y scale functions um, to explicitly set how the x and y axis should be set. So, for example, here this is a log log plot. So you see again the um, I've just picked some of the y data. I've multiplied it by a very big number in order to sorry a um, um, I, I've I've taken it um, to the um, eighth power, and then and just added a small number to avoid getting any zeros in my data set, which can upset things. Um, and then I've done the plot just as we did before, but now I go and do plot dot y scale quotes log and plot dot x scale quotes log to reset the x and the y scale from being linear to logarithmic. Um, Note that I've not changed the data, so I've not had to recalculate the data values. All I've just done is told matplotlib how it should scale the data on this particular set of axes. Um, and then I've given it a label as well. Um, so as well as um, linear scales and log scales, um, you can also use some other ones as well. Um, one that might be of interest is a symmetric log scale. So what a symmetric log scale does this gives you log scaling for very large numbers or very large negative numbers. And it gives us a linear scale in the middle so that you don't end up with problems when you try taking logs of numbers that get very, very close to zero. And so this is great when you want to look in detail at a, um, a, a small number range, but you also have large positive and negative numbers in your measurements. Um, and so this is what it looks like. And in fact, here I'm using um, certain extra parameters on the um, on the y scale function. So I've told it I'm using a symmetric log function, um, but then I've also told it that um, for uh, numbers between um, plus or minus 0.1, it should just use the linear scale. And I've told it that it should use, rather than using uh, base 10 or um, uh, natural logarithms, it should do everything on base 2. And so you see, when you look at the y-axis label there, everything is labeled up in terms of base two um, until you get to two to the minus four, um, and then just goes through zero. Um, and then just to show you the effect of what that scale is doing, the red line is in fact the line x equals y, um, which obviously looks very not straight because your scale is not linear any longer. And so it's got a straight line section in the middle where we go through the, the linear scale bit, um, and then it's um, uh, after that, it goes into the log scale. Um, uh, and so it goes more like a log function. Moving a little bit away from just uh, two dimensional scalar plots, that's where you just have a, an X and Y. Another thing you might end up with is a, um, a vector field. So that's where you have um, some quantity, which is itself is a vector um, in two dimensions. So um, uh, say we give that coordinate, say U and V, um, and uh, that varies spatially over um, a set of coordinates X and Y. So this, for example, might be if you were looking at a, um, a problem with a different electric field or a magnetic field or a gravitational field, and you're just taking a two-dimensional slice through that situation, then um, the, the field, the electromagnetic field, the gravity field, or whatever it is, or maybe it's a, a flow of liquid, um, can be described as a two-dimensional vector, um, and that itself varies over the two-dimensional slice that you've taken. Um, so you can easily uh, plot this up. Um, there are a set of functions for doing this. Um, but first of all, let's go and create our data we're going to use. So this is, again, creating a set of x and y coordinates. I then use this np.meshgrid. And what that does is it takes a um, one-dimensional array that describes how the numbers vary in the x-axis and a one-dimensional array that describes how the numbers vary in a y-axis and it returns you two two-dimensional arrays that describe the coordinates at every x and y data point. So if you like it, think about it like a, a sheet of graph paper. Um, the x and y I pass into mesh grid are my two axes. And what mesh grid returns is the coordinates of every single crossing point in the graph paper. So I then take that um, 
uh, values and I've gone and um, uh, converted those to give a uh, a set of numbers u and v which are the the, the local uh, vector and then I can plot that with a quiver plot so um, I create a figure I've just made it a square uh, plot um, and then I've used plot.quiver and I pass it the x and y coordinates of every one of those arrows and the u and the v which is the length and direction of all of those arrows and you see you get a nice sort of swirling pattern like that. Another option you can use is to use a stream plot um, and this also this sort of emphasizes how the kind of flow of the of the field you've drawn so if you're looking say at how a fluid uh, moves sort of data then maybe a stream plot is going to be more appropriate. Um, again it's using the same data set um, and other than making the the streams blue um, the, the call is almost exactly the same as we used for the uh, quiver plot. And then uh, finally, just to finish off, um, if you want to go and do a sort of simple bar chart, you know, like you might have done at primary school, um, then uh, that's easily enough done in uh, matplotlib as well. So in this example here, I've just created uh, some data. It's just a dictionary. Um, showing you the module registrations for various of the third year modules. Um, and I've used the bar h function um, and given it, um, the first thing is given it the, the list of the categories, um, so in other words, the module codes, and then the corresponding values that go with it. If I wanted to make those bars vertical, I'd have done uh, called bar rather than bar h. Um, and then you see it's just simply given me a bar chart uh, in a very kind of straightforward sort of way.